Hi, everyone. We wanted to welcome you to today's Adult MDS Chapter event brought to you by the Health Tree Foundation Community for MDS Program. My name is Mary Arnett. I am the Health Tree for MDS Community and Education Manager. I am very grateful to have each of you on here for our meeting today and for your support in building our adult MDS community. I would like to let you know that today's session will be recorded and the recording along with the slides and resources we discussed today will be sent via email to all registrants within 48 hours of the event concluding. First, we'll start with a quick Zoom meeting tutorial for anyone who's new to the platform. We would love for anyone to turn on their camera and keep it on if you feel comfortable. We believe that doing that helps us to create a stronger sense of community. As you can see on this slide, it'll show you how to turn that camera on. At the bottom of your screen, you should see the microphone and camera buttons. You can click on that video icon that says video in order to turn your camera on. Uh, with that being said, if you are not comfortable being recorded, you are not required to keep your camera on. Your microphone should currently be off and we'll keep that off uh, throughout the presentation. However, during the group discussion portion at the end, you are welcome to unmute yourself uh, if you have any questions and you'd like to ask those verbally. If you have any questions or comments for us, you can put those in the chat throughout the presentation. If you're using your mobile device or a tablet, you'll wanna click on the three dot icon that says more and then on chat in order to access the chat box to enter those questions. And lastly, if you would prefer to verbally ask your question or make a comment directly to the speaker during the discussion time at the end, we really encourage you to do so. If you're using a laptop or a desktop computer, please uh, click on the reactions near the bottom of your screen, and then you can click raise hand. If you're using a mobile device or a tablet, you can click on the three horizontal dots that say more, and then click on the raise hand button, and we will call on you so you can ask your question. So now we're going to go ahead and get started with today's event. First, I'd like to thank our sponsors who make events like this possible, and those sponsors are Bristol Myers Squibb and AbbVie. The topic for our event today is anemia and MDS, what you need to know. So this month on October 25th, we get to celebrate MDS World Awareness Day. So to celebrate this year at Health Tree for MDS, we're spending the month of October focusing on educating the MDS community as well as the general community more about anemia. Uh, so we are really excited for this event to kick off our anemia education month. So here is our agenda for the meeting today. I'm going to introduce our speaker and then he will spend the next 30 minutes or so giving us his presentation. After the presentation, we are going to open it up for questions and comments. So let me take a quick moment to introduce our speaker. He has led multi-institutional research efforts in MPNs and is actively involved in both investigator-initiated and industry-sponsored early and late phase clinical trials in myeloid neoplasms. He specializes in hematologic malignancies, including acute myeloid leukemia, myeloproliferative neoplasms, and myelodysplastic syndromes. Uh, I'm sure with his resume, you can see why we're really excited to have him on today and to present to us on anemia. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this presentation over to him. Okay, just checking. Uh, can you see my slides? Yep. Great. So Mary, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I want to take a moment to also thank Health Tree Foundation for the invitation to speak with you all today. Uh, this is a really important topic, and I think one that sometimes doesn't get enough attention, but is very common in what we'll talk about, and that's anemia and MDS. And what I really want to do today is break this down to what you need to know, and also looking towards the horizon of future therapies for this complication and this disease. Here are my disclosures. So first, I'm going to describe the burden of anemia and MDS, how, uh, how many people have it, what are the complications, and what are the sort of issues that come along with MDS and anemia. Then I'm going to talk about what the current treatment paradigm is throughout the risk continuum from low-risk disease and high-risk disease, but really focus in on those low-risk patients as well. And then I'm going to look towards future therapeutic options for anemia and MDS, different agents and different strategies that are coming through down the pike that will be part of the future therapeutic landscape. So first, let's just talk about MDS for a second. What does MDS mean? What is it? So I like to break down the word, and it, Milo really means bone marrow, and dysplastic is an abnormal differentiation, abnormal type of cells. 
And syndromes are a group of disorders, but it's very important to come out and, and say that MDS is a cancer. So the preferred nomenclature now is mild dysplastic syndrome slash neoplasm. So really highlight that these are um, malignancies. They're characterized by failure of maturation of bone marrow stem cells. So the inability of these bone marrow stem cells to create normal red blood cells, normal white blood cells, normal platelets. There's also an increased risk of transformation, the disease turning into from MDS into acute myeloid leukemia. What causes MDS? It's complicated. And as this figure shows, there's many different features, including different immune dysfunctions, environmental exposures, aging, and prior exposure to chemotherapy or radiotherapy that leads to a number of different changes, both in the bone marrow microenvironment, the kind of things that surround the stem cell, as well as within the stem cell itself, causing issues specifically with gene mutations that are acquired and changes that aren't have to do with the exact genes, but things that how the genes actually work that we call epigenetic changes. These lead to different issues such as expansion of these MDS cells that expand and cause more issues and increase issues of apoptosis or cell death and differentiation defects, the inability of cells to kind of turn into normal functioning cells. So what you really have is you have an issue where the stem cell here, it grows into these MDS initiating cells and those cells do not do a good job of turning into normal functioning red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. And that's really why you get these cytopenias, include anemia. But some of these cells also have additional genetic lesions and different factors that lead them to grow into AML cells and worsening cells and increase in these blasts that can lead to risk of progression to acute myeloid leukemia. So there are many different causes for myeloid dysplastic syndrome, and it's still being really thoroughly evaluated. But in many cases, it's really important for us to just understand that this is a stem cell disease and this originates in the bone marrow. I'm going to spend this moment just about risk stratification in MDS. So a frequent question that we get whenever we diagnose someone with MDS is, what stage am I? And over here, you see that in lung cancer, these different stages really matter. And the five-year survival rates of these different stages as you go from stage one and go to stage 1B to all the way to stage four that the survival rate progressively gets worse. Now in MDS, we don't have a staging system, so it's not stage one, two, three, or four, because the cells are automatically in the blood and going everywhere and have already kind of gone throughout your entire body. But we do have something similar, which is called risk stratification to try to understand how bad your disease is. And this is really important because the survival time of MDS can vary from several months to many, many years or decades. And so understanding what risk you are is really important. And this is an earlier iteration of a risk stratification system where you can see these are called Kaplan-Meier curves, where these lines in the blue that are more horizontal like this indicate a longer survival. And the ones lines that go down like this in a quicker rate or a poor survival, you can see these risk stratification systems actually do a really good job about dissecting and saying which patients are high risk or low risk or very low risk. But it's also important, not just in terms of prediction, but also in terms of determining the different types of treatments, what we'll talk about, including erythropoietin stimulating agents, lenalidomide, loose patercept, and more higher intensive therapies like hypomethylating agents and venetoclaxing, chemotherapy, and, and especially transplant. So really the goal is to inform, and that's really why this risk stratification is so important to stage the disease. Risk stratification 2023 is now really accomplished using a, a specific scoring system called the IPSS-M, which the M stands for molecular, which really incorporates a lot of these mutational information, cytogenetics to understand exactly what the risk of a patient is. And what it can do is differentiate patients into lower risk, and very low risk and low risk, uh, and then all the way to high and very high risk. You can see around the percentage of patients that are broken in to these different categories. And today we're really gonna start mainly focus on these type of low risk and very low risk and moderately low risk patients um, as, the, uh, as the main patients who have anemia as their primary feature that we're really trying to uh, into attack. But this is a complicated scoring system, it has many different features, including bone marrow blast, platelet count, cytogenetics, what the chromosomes look like, as well as 
mutations, especially T53 and many, many different uh, mutations. But what I want to highlight here is that although it's calculated a very complicated different system, really anemia is only one part of risk stratification. So you can have very low risk MDS and have transfusion dependent anemia. Conversely, you can have higher risk MDS and not need transfusion. So although anemia is a feature of risk stratification, it's only one part of it. In the modern days, it's only one smaller part of it. And we really focus on other issues to say what your risk is overall. With that said, though, I think anemia is an important topic to discuss because anemia is one aspect that has a lot of similarities across the risk continuum and that it can have a lot of issues. And so how common is anemia? So more than three-fourths of patients will have some degree of anemia. This is a large study of MDS patients looking at a de development of a risk score. And only 52% uh, of patients will have a hemoglobin that is less than 10. So most patients have a hemoglobin that's less than 10. But significantly, 15 to 20% of patients will have a hemoglobin that's less than 8. And those patients will have a significant burden anemia that requires red blood cell transfusions. Only about a fourth of patients will have well, of MDS patients will have no evidence of anemia, and their disease will be manifested by other cytopenias like thrombocytopenia or neutropenia. What are the clinical manifestations? What do patients report about anemia? And these things include fatigue, weakness, uh, dizziness, shortness of breath. There's also inability to exercise like they, they used to, or headaches and loss of appetite or weight change. And frequently we hear of, uh, hear of patients report of these cognitive impairments and really an inability to kind of think in a, in a brain fog. So there's a many different symptoms, but these are some of the more common ones. What's the problem with anemia? What's the burden of anemia? So anemia and specifically red blood cell transfusion are associated with many bad things in MDS. Mortality, more anemia is associated with worse mortality. Same with being red blood cell transfusion associated with a shorter survival. They're also associated with hospitalization. Also, anemia is a surrogate marker for leukemia development. So anemic patients are more likely to develop leukemia in the future. Red blood cell transfusions, frequent red blood cell transfusions can also have issues as well. And these include complications from iron overload. Red blood cell units have a lot of iron in them, and they can cause issues where the iron deposits in your body, such as your heart, liver, and endocrine glands causing issues with heart dysfunction, hepatic dysfunction, liver dysfunction, or diabetes. There's also a, quali a financial burden to transfusions and red blood cell and anemia in general, where more days are missed from work and there's more time that's needed in an infusion suite to get red blood cell transfusions and the travel associated with it. And, and I think that's something that we as providers sometimes under-recognize is the financial burden from a patient uh, standpoint that being anemic and requiring transfusions can really be a negative detriment to your overall quality of life. I will mention that there are subtypes of MDS that are specifically associated with anemia that I want to mention right now because I'm going to mention it a few times in this talk, and I want everyone to be oriented what they're about. And the first one is deletion 5Q or 5Q minus MDS. This encompasses about 10 to 15% of MDS patients and is really characterized by a more indolent course in the sense that there's lower rates of progression to acute myeloid leukemia, but also severe anemia. This right here is a karyotype, and we see all of your different chromosomes here, all 46 chromosomes, all 23 pairs. And, and in the fifth chromosome, there's a loss of one of the long arm of one of the, of the chromosomes. And this is really what defines 5Q minus. The other type of MDS that I want to call attention to is MDS with ring sideroblasts. And this is really a, a pathologic feature under the bone marrow biopsy that special standing. So you can see these depositions of iron in a ring around some of these developing red blood cells. They're characterized by a high prevalence of the mutation in SF3B1 and again, a more insulin course, but anemia is a really common feature. So while I'm calling out these subtypes early on is that both of these have therapeutic implications, which we're going to get to in the next section. So now I'm going to talk through what the current treatment paradigm is for anemia and MDS. Where are we right now? 
Some general principles that I want to talk about first include uh, treatment is primarily driven by symptoms. There's no data suggest preemptive treatment improves outcomes in MDS. And the, the ways we really measure the burden of anemia is based on symptoms. There are people who have uh, low symptom burden with moderate or severe anemia and people who have a uh, severe symptom burden with more mild anemia. So that's an important feature to really understand. Treatment is generally not dictated by subtype with a notable exception that includes deletion 5Q minus uh, MDS and MDS with ring sideroblasts. Treatment can be dictated by certain laboratory values, including erythropoietin level and other counts being low, as well as the overall risk. So someone who is high risk and has anemia is often treated different than someone who's low risk and has isolated anemia. In general, though, red blood cell transfusions may be required if the hemoglobin gets less than eight and especially less than seven. So first step, what is the first step that we really do when we're trying to address anemia and MDS is we measure it at a level called erythropoietin or EPO. EPO is a hormone that's made in the kidneys in response to anemia. And if you have a high EPO level, it stimulates the bone marrow to correct that anemia. We do have drugs that are exogenous or treats uh, EPO that has been manufactured, and we can inject that can increase the amount of EPO and again, stimulate the bone marrow to correct that anemia. The issue is, is that if you already have a high EPO level in your blood, giving more EPO through an injection will not help the bone marrow stimulate more anemia, so more hemoglobin production. So one of the first steps we do is we measure this erythropoietin level. And if it is low, we can give exogenous erythropoietin, what we call erythropoietin stimulating agents. And this is another one of those Kaplan-Meier curves. And in the black here, is the, uh, this is from a randomized trial of placebo versus erythropoietin in patients who were transfusion dependent with MDS. And what you see is that there is a significant improvement here in the time to the first red blood cell transfusion in patients who are treated with erythropoietin versus placebo. So it is effective in delaying the time you, until you need your first red blood cell transfusion if you're anemic. But there is prediction models that we have developed to try to understand which patients are going to be the ones who are going to respond to exogenous erythropoietin. And this is one such model that's summarized here. We have a serum erythropoietin level that's less than 100. That really predicts someone who is going to respond to erythropoietin because their own body's making of erythropoietin is already low enough that giving more may actually stimulate the red blood cells to develop and you have improvement in your anemia. But if you're over five, that is a negative factor that really suggests that you will not have a good response. Transfusions as well, if you are heavily transfusion, if you uh, burden, if you have a lot of transfusions, then that is a sign that it is less likely that you're going to respond to erythropoietin. So if you look at uh, low risk MDS and you tally up these scores, a score that's greater than one suggests about 70% of people will respond to erythropoietin, which is pretty good. But if the sum of the score is less than one, is a minus one, then you're probably going to have a poor response. And I'll note that because greater than 500 is a nine, negative three points, that no matter what the other score is for red blood cell transfusion, that already predicts someone who's going to be a very poor responder. So this helps us determine people who may respond to erythropoietin and who may not. What are some options for these erythropoietin stimulating agents? There's basically two, erythropoietin alpha and darbopoietin, and these have different brand names. Erythropoietin alpha is called uh, epigen, procrit, reticrit, and darbopoietin is called aranesp, and they have slightly different dosing and frequency, but they share the same sort of side effects and response rates. So side effects of these medications include exacerbations of hypertension. So if you have high blood pressure already, this could exacerbate it. And there's also concern in that if you bring up the hemoglobin too high, it's going to increase your risk for having a blood clot. This has been shown in other diseases where we use these drugs, but it hasn't really been as validated in MDS, although we try not to bring up the hemoglobin too high with these medications. You need at least about four months of treatment before you can really say this agent did not work for you. And so it is important that even after a few 
months or weeks of trying, it may take longer for a response to be garnered. And the response rates, which is really a, a hemoglobin of 10 to 12 or hemoglobin of great rise of greater than 1.5 or reduced transfusion requirements, happens in about 45 to 73% of patients. Although, as I showed sh shared in the previous slide, that we can predict that number a little bit better based on the baseline erythropoietin level and the amount of transfusions. And importantly, there has not been shown to be a difference between erythropoietin, alpin, and darbopoietin. How about lenalidomide? This is another drug that we use frequently to try to improve anemia, and it has many complicated mechanisms of actions, which we are still trying to understand. But what it really does is it really attacks those malignant stem cells that cause MDS, and it also causes some changes in the immune system to try to improve the cytopenias by reducing these things called inflammatory cytokines, which prevent the bone marrow from making red blood cells and also helps the immune system find the MDS cells and, and attack them. So it does many different things here, but it really works in many different ways to try to improve anemia in MDS patients. So lenalidomide has been tested in a number of different studies, and this is a phase two study that was done in the, in the 2000s that looked at patients who were given lenalidomide with low-risk MDS. And what they really found is that erythroid responses or transfusion responses were found in about 56% of patients, which is pretty good. But the real response that you got, especially in terms of chromosomal abnormalities, was really associated with the deletion in 5Q. Other features and other cytogenetic abnormalities did not really get as many as improvements in their cytogenetics and were not as effective. There are side effects with these medications. They do cause lower white blood cell counts and can cause lower platelet counts as well too. And this happens in not an insignificant number of patients. So it's very important to monitor the blood counts while giving this drug. It has also been tested specifically in those 5Q minus patients in different dosing regimens, including continuous dosing or 21 day dosing. And again, what was shown here is significant improvements in the amount of uh, transfusion uh, independence. So about two thirds of patients became transfusion independent and another about 10% of patients had a greater than 50% increase in the number of transfusions. It can take some time to respond with an average or median time to response of about 4.6 weeks. But the improvement in the hemoglobin level is really remarkable with about an immediate improvement of 5.4 grams per deciliter, which is quite great. It also significantly reduced the time to the first transfusion in these patients, where this actually was not even reached after a long-term follow-up. So what this data shows us is that lenalidomide is really the treatment of choice for patients with 5Q minus MDS. How about lenalidomide if you don't have a 5Q minus? This has also been tested in, an, in, a, in a randomized controlled trial showing significant improvements in the type of patients who do get, in, in many patients who do not have a 5Q minus, who do get improvements in red blood cell transfusion for greater than eight weeks in about a quarter of patients. This wasn't entirely long lived as many patients uh, didn't have, enjoy a free of freedom from transfusion for even a year. But I will say that it's very easy to kind of predict if you've had, if you will respond to this. And patients who have a high erythropoietin level are much less likely to respond than patients who have a low erythropoietin level. And if you've had a prior erythropoietin use and you have a low erythropoietin level, you're more likely to respond than patients who have a high erythropoietin level and have a uh, high uh, prior erythropoietin stimulating agent use. So it can also be used in patients who don't have a 5Q minus. How about loose patercept rebozal? And this is a drug that works in many different ways, but it really traps up these things called TGF beta molecules and ligands and traps them up. And what it does is it causes inhibition and in, in, uh, of SMAD signaling and leads to differentiation of different pathways that lead to erythroid development, so red blood cell development. So it takes these younger red blood cells and allows them to grow up into more uh, adult and, and functional red blood cells. 
this, this has been a really interesting kind of concept to kind of convince the bone marrow through these different modulation of TGF beta to try to develop more red blood cells. So it has been tried in a phase two study, which I'm showing you the results of here. And what I'll show is that, you know, it really did improve transfusion rates in a significant number of patients. And these are two different measures of how you uh, measure transfusion independence and erythroid response rates. But it is more effective in patients who have a lower transfusion burden than higher transfusion burden. It didn't seem to matter if you've had a prior erythroids uh, simulating agent use. But one thing that really came out of here, though, is that patients who had ring sideroblasts seemed to respond significantly better than patients who didn't have ring sideroblasts, where depending on how you define a erythroid response, uh, almost uh, double or 50% more patients had a uh, erythroid response and had a red blood cell transfusion independence response if you had had a ring sideroblast. In addition, I told you earlier that ring sideroblasts often uh, occurs at the same time with a mutation in a gene called SF3B1. And here also, if you had an SF3B1 mutation, you also had a significantly higher chance of responding. So this led to the development of a randomized uh, control trial that included patients with those two features who either had ring sideroblast or ring sideroblast with an SF3B1 mutation and had lower intermediate risk. And importantly, patient, these patients all had been treated with a erythropoietin stimulating agent or were going to be ineligible, and they were transfusion dependent. They're randomized two to one to either this drug loose pattern step, which is an injection every three weeks, or placebo. And the dose was up titrated all the way to 1.75 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks. Here are the results of the clinical trial, and this shows that there's significantly a number of patients who had responses with loose batter spec versus placebo, especially responses with transfusion dependence for eight weeks or 12 weeks, and as well as modern for 16 weeks. And this is significantly more than the number of people who had responses with just a sugar injection with placebo. So loose patterns have seems to be very effective in this population with ring sideroblast or SF3B1 mutation. I'm gonna just briefly touch on immunosuppressive therapy. And these are drugs that try to suppress the immune system. The theory is that in certain type of features, such as patients who have a PNH clone or certain T cell clones, that those features of the immune system are causing an autoimmune issue that is suppressing the ability to make red blood cells. And so this looked at some improvements in about 30% of patients who had uh, treatment with ATG or cyclosporin or other types of immunosuppressive therapies. And this worked especially well in this type of MDS where you have low blood bone marrow cellularity. So the amount of cells in your bone marrow is very low and a special subtype this seemed to be particularly active in. So where we are so far is that we've talked about if your erythropoietin level is less than 500, we're going to talk about an erythropoietin stimulating agent. If you uh, have a 5Q minus, then we're going to talk about lenalidomide as a treatment of choice. If you have ring sideroblast or SF3B1, we'll talk about loose patercept. And if you have a PNH or hypoplastic or low bone marrow blood cells, we'll talk about immunosuppressive uh, therapy. What about hypomethylating agents? And these are agents that are frequently given in higher risk MDS that can really imp create improved response rates in higher risk MDS. And how they work is through a number of different mechanisms. They look very similar to a part of the DNA called uh, cytidine, and they can incorporate into the DNA. But what they really also do is they inhibit this enzyme called DNA methyltransferase, which allows for things called methylation status on the DNA, which controls the ability for the genes to really express themselves and, and kind of read out what they're really encoding for. So it works in multiple different ways. And there's two different commonly used uh, hypomethylating agents, azacytidine, which is given at 75 milligrams sub-Q days one through seven in a 28-day cycle, or decitamine, which can be either given IV or there's an oral formulation as well, which is given 20 milligrams per meter squared days one through five. Both are standard of care and higher risk uh, MDS as well as an AML and can be combined with other agents as well. 
So how does HMA therapy work for improving hemoglobin? And this was a really interesting study that randomized patients to one of these two regimens, but for a shorter duration, for only three days instead of either seven days with azacitinine or five days with the cytobine. And what I'm showing you here, though, I think is the most important feature for the relevance of this talk, was if you are transfusion independent at baseline, it does cause some transfusion dependency in about 10% of patients, whether you're getting decitabine or azacitidine. But what's really important here is if you're transfusion dependent at baseline, if you already require red blood cell transfusions, at the end of the study, about two thirds of people ended up being transfusion independent. So HMA therapy is a really good option for people who need to rehabilitate their bone marrow, especially in higher risk disease, but also can be given in shorter courses in low risk MDS as well. So this is where we're at overall with the overall treatment algorithm. If you're anemia and you have a deletion of 5Q minus, we really measure your erythropoietin level. If it's low, we'll give erythropoietin stimulant agent, sometimes another agent. But if that doesn't work, then we really think about giving lenalidomide. And if that doesn't work, then we're kind of on to other therapies. If you don't have a 5Q minus and you have a low erythropoietin level, again, we'll give erythropoietin stimulating agent. But if that doesn't work, then we look if you have a hypoplastic, a low bone marrow cellularity type, and we'll talk about giving immunosuppressive therapy. And if you have a ring sideroblast or an SF3B1 mutation, we'll talk about loose patercept. In either of these scenarios, if that doesn't work, then we look on to other therapies like hypomethylating agents or lenalidomide if you didn't get it in the uh, in the 5Q minus round, as well as other targeted therapies in clinical trial and even stem cell transplant. So the first summary of this of this part is anemia is common in MDS and frequently leads to many symptoms and complications and, and the need for red blood cell transfusion. Really determining the EPA level is the first step. And this it helps us predict who's going to respond to erythropoietin stimulating agent uh, and who will not. Lenalidomide is really effective in MDS with 5Q minus, but also can be given after erythropoietin stimulating agent failure. And loose patercepts are active in the setting of ring sideroblasts or an SF3B1 mutation. HMA therapy can be given as last resort or in patients who have high risk disease potential, especially those with multiple cytopenias. So now I'm going to look towards the horizon and, and talk about future therapeutic considerations that are already starting to work their way into our, our treatment algorithm. And the first is about loose powder steps. So we had discussed before that loose powder steps was really tested primarily in patients who had already failed an erythro-stimulating agent or were not eligible for erythropoietin stimulating agent. So this is the command study that really asked the question, instead of waiting until failure and only in patients who have uh, aren't going to respond to erythropoietin stimulating agent, what if you gave loose patercept before erythropoietin stimulating agent? So it took low-risk MDS patients who had a bone marrow blast that was less than 5%, didn't have a 5Q minus, they had never received an erythropoietin stimulating agent, and they were transfusion dependent. And it randomized patients one-to-one -to, -one to either loose patercept or giving them that erythropoietin stimulating agent. And the results were really surprising and I think really impressive where there was a significant improvement in the red blood cell transfusion independence for at least 12 weeks when you gave loose patercept first instead of erythropoietin first. There's also a significant improvement in 24-week red blood cell transfusion independence and hematological improvement by erythroid uh, whenever you gave loose patercept first. So loose patercept first, even in the situations where we just said erythropoietin stimulating agent should be given, that seems to be more effective than giving erythropoietin stimulating agent. There were specific subtypes of MDS that seemed to be even better. So it didn't really matter if you had a high transfusion burden or if you had a low. But remember before that, if you had ring sideroblasts in the prior studies, we noticed those patients responded best to loose powder step. But here, the ring sideroblasts again seemed to outperform erythropoietin stimulating agent in patients who had a ring sideroblast. But we didn't see that same effect in patients who didn't have a ring sideroblast. It didn't really matter what your baseline erythropoietin level, but again, it seemed like patients who had an SF3B1 mutation had a significant improvement and the chance that they would respond, they would that loose patercept would be better than erythropoietin stimulating agent. So loose patercept is now approved actually for treatment of anemia in patients with lower risk MDS who may require transfusion even before charting 
trying uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents. So nowadays in the, in the, the modern treatment now, we give loose first, even in patients who have erythropoietin stimulating agents, haven't experienced those before, even if they're eligible for it. Although I will note that there are certain subsets where it's more equivocal, as I mentioned before, if you lack a ring sideroblast, if you lack an SF3B1 mutation, there may be still a reason to, uh, to give ESA, but this still remains to be worked out. How about a metal stat? A metal stat's a really interesting drug that call, is called a telomerase inhibitor. A telomerase is an enzyme that lengthens chromosomes, and this drug really inhibits its ability to do that because MDS cells we know, and these malignant clones of MDS cells have an elongation of their chromosomes to try to survive longer. And it really leads to cell death in these MDS clones, and because of cell death of the MDS clones, allowing for normal blood cell development to occur. So this has been evaluated in a phase three study called the EMERGE study that took patients with lower intermediate risk MDS who had already been experienced to an erythropoietin stimulating agent or they're not eligible because of a high EPO level and they're red blood cell transfusion dependent. And it randomized patients two to one to this drug, a metal stat, which is given every four weeks as an infusion or placebo and really looked at the primary endpoint was a red blood cell transfusion independence for eight weeks. And again, the results, which have only been presented in abstract form so far, were really impressive where there's a significant improvement in the number of patients who had red blood cell transfusion independence for eight weeks, 16 weeks, 24 weeks, and even one year in patients who were treated with a metal stat versus patients who were treated with placebo. So this drug really seems to rescue uh, in, in failure of erythropoietin stimulating agent therapy. And importantly, though, I find this is a study that this is an analysis that looks at which patients responded better. And in contrast to the prior plot I showed you, it doesn't seem to matter too much if you are ring sideroblast positive or negative, if you had um, a prior transfusion burden or not, or what your erythropoietin stimulating agent uh, burden was, that across all of those different subtypes, you had a significant improvement in the people who of imotelstat over uh, placebo. So this drug is really poised to potentially change the game in terms of uh, treatment across the different risk spectrum. Not all drugs that go into clinical development are successes, and this is Roxodustat, which is a drug that is really interesting, and it blinds a, um, a drug called uh, HIF1-alpha and leads to its degradation, which is supposed to improve erythropoietin levels and red blood cell um, production, but this drug did not work in a phase three uh, MDS study. How about iron overload? I mentioned this earlier that not only does iron cause issues because it can cause different organ dysfunction, but it also can cause issues within the bone marrow as well, where it can change the bone marrow environment and prevent the bone marrow from actually being able to produce red blood cells. So too much iron tells the bone marrow, I need to stop making red blood cells. So there's been efforts to try things called iron chelation therapies, which can try to remove the, the excess iron from your body. And it really was successful in this three-year event-free survival. But what I will note is that the improvements in red blood cell transfusion versus uh, versus placebo were not significantly better. So just by itself, I don't think it's a, a real reason to do iron chelation therapy, although there is an argument to be made in certain patients with a heavy uh, iron overload and heavy transfusion burden to consider iron chelation therapy. There's there's also many other drugs that are on the horizon which have preliminary evidence or are being tested in other, uh, other higher-risk MDS as well. And these look at targeting inflammation in MDS. In, in MDS is a very inflammatory disease, and trying to understand how you can quelch the immune system is something that there are many different targets and different drugs that are currently in development and are being tested in MDS to see if this can be part of the future therapeutic paradigm of, of MDS. So the second summary and the final summary is that Luspatercept is now FDA approved for erythropoietin stimulating naive, low risk and intermediate risk MDS with anemia. And metalstat is a telomerase inhibitor, which is a new treatment and can be beneficial in low risk MDS patients across different subtypes. Iron chelation therapy, you can consider it in select patients who have a high iron level, who have a, a very heavy transfusion 
the burden. And novel therapies, novel treatments that target inflammation and MDS may offer a significant benefit in anemic MDS patients in the future. So with that, I'll say thank you. And, and I provided my contact information here. And I, and I really do encourage all the, the, the patients and, uh, and loved ones watching today to reach out to me with any questions or, or anything. I, I always try to make myself as available as possible to the entire patient community. And again, I want to thank you all for your, your attention and be happy to take any questions. Wow. Thank you so much for this whole presentation. That was incredibly informative. I feel like I learned a lot uh, and we do already have some questions in. Um, so we got a question from a patient in Australia who's not able to be on the call today, but is excited to watch the recording. And they want to know uh, what type of vitamins or supplements are out there, if there are any that help with anemia. Yeah, this is a really common question that we we get. And, you know, uh, I wish there were vitamins that would really improve anemia in a significant way. The most common and obvious one is iron, which is a, a fundamental building block for red blood cells. So you would think more iron in your body, better ability for your body to make red blood cells. Unfortunately, because of the burden of red blood cell transfusions, because of some of the mechanisms that cause MDS, there, it's not a problem with not having enough building blocks. So you can think about, about it more as the, the machine that is built putting together red blood cells isn't working well. So even trying to input more vitamins or, uh, or iron into the system isn't going to help that situation. So in terms of vitamins, we don't typically recommend any specific vitamins and unless there is a, uh, an otherwise noted vitamin deficiency. But we do encourage patients to speak with our nutritionist in order to understand uh, a healthy diet and ways to improve their well-being with food. And, and, and that sometimes does occasionally incorporate supplements as well. Thank you. Uh, we also had a question come in earlier in your presentation about iron overload, which you ended up touching on there at the end. Uh, but part of their question was just how common is iron overload in, after blood transfusions? Yeah, it's it can be very common, but it becomes more common with the, the higher burden of red blood cell transfusions. So frequently we think this is typically a problem when you receive 20 or 25 uh, red blood cell transfusions in your life. And it is something that is relatively simple to measure. There's a, a, a laboratory called ferritin, which is a measure of your iron stores. And if that is elevated, especially above a thousand or so, that it can be suggestive of iron overload. So as the amount of red blood cell transfusion someone requires goes up, that is uh, iron chelation therapy and something to try to get rid of some of the iron is something we, we discuss. Uh, so just as a reminder for anyone else who wants to ask questions, we've got a couple more coming in. Uh, if you want to type those in the chat, you're welcome to add them there. Or if you'd like to ask your question verbally, you can raise your hand um, and we can call on you to answer your question. Uh, so we have another question from Michelle. She said, what type of questions should I be asking my doctor to help us decide how to treat anemia? That's an excellent question. I think that it is important for a discussion with your doctor to include not only what options are available in terms of things like red blood cells, but also really asking those questions about what about erythropoietin stimulating agents? What about loose patercept? What about lenalidomide? And what subtype of MDS do I have? I think it's really important because we often discuss MDS and many diseases as one large disease, but there's many different subtypes of MDS. And I've met many patients with MDS and I've never met two patients who have the same MDS. So I think it's important for uh, patients to advocate for themselves to be understand what their sort of subtype is and what sort of therapies are involved in their subtype. I think one thing to take away from the presentation today is that there are certain therapies that work better in certain subtypes of MDS. So lenalidomide and 5Q minus or loose patercept and SF3B1 or ring sideroblast, or if you have a very low cellular of your bone marrow immunosuppressive therapies. So try to understand that and challenge your, your, your healthcare provider to, um, to really understand that as well too, I think can help make the best treatment decisions that you can make as a, as a patient. 
Thank you. Uh, we have another question from someone on the call, John. He said, hi, John from the UK. Uh, I am SF3B1, EZH2, and ASXL1 mutated, low intermediate risk, watch and wait right now. Uh, it's great to see these improvements for when I suffer from MDS. What supplements can help delay the onset of problematic symptoms? Or is there anything like diet, intermittent fasting, anything like that that they can do to try to delay that as long as possible? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And I and I, I really appreciate John's question. And this is actually a good example of someone who really knows their kind of mutational batter, pattern of risk and it is really informed. So I really uh, congratulate John on that. In terms of uh, delaying onset of symptoms, no specific treatments have really been shown to specifically delay the progression in a way that it is meaningful. However, I do encourage uh, a, a healthy diet and exercise because it is important to start this MDS journey from a very good place and as healthful as possible so that if complications do arise in the future, your body's in a good place to try to um, counteract those complications. In terms of intermittent fasting, there has not been, to the best of my knowledge, direct evidence within MDS, whether this is helpful or not. And I would, you know, caution that it, uh, that not much is known about the beneficial and also harmful effects of intermittent fasting within someone who has a blood disease. With that said, though, I personally recommend for my patients to do what makes them feel best. And some of my patients do report that certain diets or intermittent fasting has helped them feel more energetic um, and, and feel better. And if that's the case, I encourage that. Absolutely. But I wouldn't make yourself miserable by skipping, you know, breakfast and lunch every day with the understanding that we don't know yet. And it's not established if that would do anything in terms of delaying progression of the disease. Hi, John here, just to join in. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm really enjoying, I mean, it sounds sad or missed, but I quite enjoy the challenge. And actually, it's uh, honestly, once you get in the swing of I'm doing 16, 8 fasting. So basically, I make sure I finish by 7, 7.30 at night. And I don't eat till 11.30, 12 the next day. When I wake up, I think, oh, yeah, I could eat something. But you soon get distracted. And I, I'm enjoying trying this stuff because i'm watching weight so there's nothing medically intervening at the moment so in the interim i'm enjoying almost the challenge i've stopped drinking alcohol almost <laughs> and because i used to drink a lot um can i ask a secondary sort of question which is more curiosity as, as you can see i am interested in learning all this stuff um is you know do you, and I'm sorry, I couldn't join you at the beginning, so you may have touched on this. I guess everyone, you know, and I'm quite new to this, it's only six months ago, and you have that why me thing. And I, I've i I've got kind of, I'm old, so I've got a rich history of what I call personal epidemiology, you know, using creosote, uh, working in a gas station when I was a teenager, smoking probably as one very good reason for 30 years i stopped you know 20 years ago um those sort of things it feels like well i'm a statistic i know but i'd love to feed somewhere my stupid life uh, you know who knows a sunscreen i mean now that's that's another thing that yeah you know, benzene we have a oil fired heat furnace as you would call it which actually had a leak in it for years. Um, these are all kind of, oh, I wonder if that was me. Now, I know you shouldn't personalize it that much, but I'd love to share, hey, this is me. And then if you had like 100, 200 people like me, there could be some really good uh, understanding of what the triggers were. And I just wondered if there's a place to share that. Well, that's excellent. Thank you so much, John. It's a I will say for the to wrap up the intermittent fasting, if it works for you, that's excellent. I am I, I'm one of the people who have tried intermittent fasting and my wife almost divorced me. So it's not for not for me, but if you feel better with it, that's that's excellent. Regarding your question about environmental triggers for MDS, this is a really important and a really interesting area of research that is is ongoing. 
Now, there are certain known risk factors for MDS, and, and one of them that you mentioned is benzene exposure, but then even more commonly is chemotherapy and radiation and, and tobacco smoking as well. But it's very challenging to try to look back and say, this is exactly what caused my blood cancer, and this is exactly the instance that did it. But I do encourage your investigations into trying to understand environmental features that can lead to the development of MDS as a way to prevent future generations from trying to experience that same sort of uh, harm. Now, in terms of what resources are available to try to understand the risk factors, these studies are very challenging to perform because they require thousands and tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of um, patients to understand the the difference between people who got MDS and people who who also live next to a gas station and smoke cigarettes and, and everything and, and didn't get MDS. Now, I'm not sure what the resources are in the UK, um, but I can follow up on that and see if some of our UK colleagues know of any sort of resources. In the United States, there's been a, a number of different epidemiologic studies that have taken place through a number of different large kind of databases, as well as sort of natural history studies to understand some of the epidemiologic exposures. But I will say that it's probably a very understudied aspect of MDS and something that deserves a lot more attention thanks to, and I hope in the future, thanks to people like like John here, this that will be increased attention towards the environmental exposures that lead to the development of MDS. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question, John. I think that was very informative for everyone, and I hope you got a little bit of what you were looking for. Um, I'd like to put in a little plug for Health Tree really quick, because what you're talking about, John, is one of the main focuses of what we're trying to do at Health Tree. We have this program called Cure Hub um, that's just launched in MDS. We've already been doing it in myeloma for over 10 years. Um, and what Cure Hub allows is for patients to uh, consent to connect their medical records, and then it allows all of their medical records for the patient for you to be able to see everything in one place from all of your facilities um, in order to be able to track your disease. Uh, but it also allows you to fill in a bunch of those demographic personal type questions as well, um, things that you are curious about with your diagnosis, and then allows that to be seen, used in research, and for you to find patients who have similar experiences to you, um, things like that. So that's something we're trying to help with. Um, and like uh, we just talked about, it's a big part of MDS diagnoses and with blood cancer in general. Um, so if we have, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, so unless there are any last minute questions from anybody on the call, I think we are going to go ahead and move on. Thank you so much for this presentation. I think it was incredibly impactful, informational. Um, so I am going to take over here for a second. So after, now that we just wrapped up our uh, discussion portion of the event, which I think was a great success today, uh, I'd like to take a second to mention our next events that are gonna be coming up here in the month of October. Uh, first, we have an a podcast episode that's going to be coming out on October 17th. It will be live. So if you're interested in uh, calling in, if you have any questions or you'd like to listen then, then you're welcome to do that. Uh, during this podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Kelly Bolton to discuss CCUS and MDS precursor condition. We'll talk a little bit about what progression from CCUS uh, into MDS can look like. And Dr. Bolton will also be talking about her uh, PIMM PIM study that's looking into CCUS. So you won't want to miss that conversation. I'm really excited about that. And then we also have another really exciting event for you this month. On October 23rd, Health Tree Foundation is launching Health Tree 2.0, which is kind of a refocus um, on research. And this event is going to showcase some of the Health Tree team, some incredible keynote speakers, and how you as patients and caregivers can be a part of the important research to help. Uh, find and accelerate cures for all blood cancers. If you're interested in joining, you can register at the link there and then you'll be able to watch. It's going to be a live party. It's going to be really fun. 
Uh, if you're interested in hosting a watch party for this event, we want to help encourage that. So if you want to have friends and family um, come over, watch the live recording or watch the live broadcast, you can reach out to me at mary at healthtree.org uh, and we will send you a little party kit with some party decorations and some little favors to help you uh, kind of outfit your party. We're really excited about this event and hope you'll consider tuning in and celebrating with us. Uh, you can see that uh, link at the bottom or the website healthtree.org-mds-community-events. That's where you can find those events and you can register. And then finally, we want to take a moment to thank the, our Health Tree sponsors again, without whom this event would not have been possible, and that is Bristol Myers Squibb and AbbVie. And finally, I just want to end by saying thank you to everyone who joined the call today and is helping us to build this MDS community. I really appreciate all of you, and I hope each of you have a great rest of your day and hope to see you again on our future events soon. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me. I put my email there on the screen. You can reach out if you have any questions about Healthtree, upcoming events, MDS, anything like that. Uh, so I just thank you, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day.